Thank you, Terry. Well, I have my mic on, but it's not. Is my mic on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Ladies, in all of U.S. history, only nine people have received the rank of a five-star general. Five Army and four Navy officers received five stars, but there's a man inside the Old Testament who is the equivalent of a five-star general. And so you immediately know when I say that, that this man was a guy of importance. He was a man of importance. His name was Naaman. If you want to go to your worksheet, his name was Naaman, and he was second in command to King Ben-Hadad, who ruled over Syria. His name was Naaman. He was the equivalent of a five-star general. He was second in command to King Ben-Hadad, who ruled over Syria. Now, people only had great things to say about Naaman. He was dependable. He was an amazing leader. He was a real go-getter. In today's language, if we wanted, if we wanted to say, okay, I can't really relate to a five-star general, Susie. Uh, military doesn't relate to me. Well, then we could equate his importance in, in these terms, we could say he would have easily been a state senator or he could have been a governor. Uh, again, five-star general. That's, that's uh, the level of importance he was. Just very important. Well, what does the Bible have to say about Naaman? Okay, people had only good things to say about him, but what does the Bible have to say? Well, let's look at your worksheets. In 2 Kings 5.1, by him, God had given victory unto Syria. So through this man, through Naaman, God had wiped out enemy armies and he had built up Syrian commerce and had given power and wealth and victory to this country of Syria. Yes, question? Oh, you're getting feedback? Charlie, can you do something? They're getting lots of feedback. <laughs> oh, and it's way too loud and it's echoing. How's this? <laughs> okay, let, let me just do some testing here. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, whatever. Me alegra mucho tener el honor de estar con ustedes. Por muchos años he tenido el deseo de conocer el trabajo de la iglesia en otros países. Dios ahora lo ha hecho posible. Es necesario ayudar en todo lo que me sea posible y sobre todo vivir a mi Dios, iglesias y, y a mi ustedes en Cristo. Jesucristo es no solamente número uno en mi vida, pero Jesucristo es toda mi vida. Sí. Y yo tiene mucho gozo en mi corazón porque es Jesucristo y Él es mi mejor amigo. Amén. <laughs> and that's all I know. <laughs> But I know that one part really well. <laughs> Okay, how's the feedback and the volume now? Is it okay? Do you want me to start over? No. Okay, good. We can go on. I think, I think Charlie's got us on the roll. Hey, give Charlie a hand. He has done a great job. Charlie is the man. He's done a great job so far. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, so let's just repeat just this little part. Let's see what the Bible has to say about Naaman. It says, through him. Through him or by him, God had given victory unto Syria. And so through this man, Naaman, God had wiped out enemy armies. And he had built up the Syrian commerce. And he had given power and wealth and victory to this country called Syria. So, Naaman, if you want to go back to your handouts, Naaman was God-blessed, he was God-guided, and God-used as well as respectable and honorable. Let me repeat that. He was God-blessed. He was God-guided and God-used as well as respectable and honorable. Now, all who were underneath Naaman loved him. His position commanded respect, but everyone wanted to respect him. How many of you have known a leader like that? Their, yes, their position commands respect, but you want to respect him or her because that person is just such a good, good leader. That's how Naaman was. People loved him. He was a great leader. Well, let's go back to your worksheet. Scripture also says that he was a mighty man of valor. He was a mighty man of valor. That means... 
He was courageous. And he was bold. He was a mighty man of valor, courageous and bold. Now, after Scripture has said all these wonderful things about our man named Naaman, there's a comma, not a period. There's a comma. And then five words. And they are game changers. Let's look at them. But he was a great hero, but he was a leper. So he was a great hero, but he was a leper. Those five words will be a game changer for this great man. Those five words were the most feared words in the language at that time because leprosy was fatal. And it's a horrific disease. Now, on the very back of your worksheets, I have symptoms of leprosy and some little-known trivia facts about leprosy. You can look at those later, but it will kind of help you understand how, uh, how to interpret leprosy and help you understand it a little bit better. Ladies, it was a disgusting disease. I mean, your flesh would rot, and there was nothing worse than the smell of rotting flesh. That was awful. Now imagine getting this news, okay? The tests have been run, the phone rings, and it's your doctor. He says, the results are in. The results are in. You have leprosy. You are a leper. No. No. No, my son is getting, to gra getting ready to graduate. No, 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 no. My daughter's getting married in three months. I can't, I can't have leprosy. No, my husband and I are finally getting to go on that cruise that we've been talking about for decades. No, no, I can't, I can't have leprosy. Well, suddenly you're no longer a part of any of that because you are now a leper. Yeah. give the physician's medical staff discernment and wisdom and that she would be okay. Is it okay if I pray for her again right now? Let's do that. Father, thank you that uh, Debbie is in good hands now, that the ambulance people got here quickly and safely. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, we, we pray, Lord, again for your healing. We pray that uh, the medical staff would be given your discernment and wisdom. They would be able to quickly assess what's going on with Debbie, what made her faint, and how to treat her. Lord, thank you for bringing Debbie here to be with us. We pray that you would continue to minister to her, Lord, where she is, in the hospital or the ER room where she is. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Isn't it great that we can just stop whatever we are, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, and just stop and say, you know what, slow down everything. There's a need right now, and God wants to meet that need. And that's the excitement of the body of Christ coming together together. Uh, and going straight to the throne room. Okay, so we have five words that are going to be a game changer for Naaman. Uh, the Bible says, so he was a great hero, but he was a leper. Those five words. Yeah, Charlie's already got it on the screen. Those five words. Now, let me just repeat. Um, leprosy was a fatal disease, and it was a disgusting disease. I mean, you might remember uh, in, in the New Testament hearing, uh, reading stories about people who were lepers, and they would have to say, unclean, unclean, when they walked out in public so that people would not get too close to them, and they would have to walk across the street by themselves, alone. Wouldn't you hate that? Uh, every time you left your house or went into the grocery store or whatever to have to shout, unclean, well... Uh, realistically, you wouldn't be able to go to the grocery store because you wouldn't be allowed in that kind of a public setting. But even to, to go outside or to walk around the block or to exercise, unclean, don't get too close to me. Wow, talk about a, putting a label on yourself. Well, that's how it was with lepers in those days. And so um, I ask you to imagine what it would be like if you got that kind of news. The doctor calls, hey, the tests have been run, the results are in, and you have leprosy. No, no, how can that be? Because I have these plans or my husband and I made these plans together. Well, not for you, because you're a leper, and you can't move ahead with your daughter's wedding or, or your retirement party or the cruise that you had planned on, on going to. What you have is fatal, and your family and your friends can no longer come near you because you're a leper. Can you imagine going years now without being hugged, without being touched, uh, without feeling loved by, by touch because you're now unclean. No one got physically close 
to someone who is a leper. Uh, let's look at a few slides I want to show you of leprosy. Uh, here's a, a lady's hand. You'll notice um, her hands, just, she just has nubs as fingers because her fingers have rotted away to those little nub stubs. Let's look at the next one. Lady with no fingers at all. She doesn't even have little nubs or stubs and her teeth. She doesn't have any teeth. Her, her eyes are affected. She has a scarred face. Let's look at the next one. This shows a hand in the beginning stages of leprosy. And I have one more. This man has missing toes. He has a missing foot. He has missing fingers. His eyes are gone. His nose is badly infected and it's swollen. Well, inside of this horrific situation that we're in now with Naaman, we're inside his horrific situation of leprosy, inside of this we find one brave girl. And God is going to use that girl to change the course of Naaman's life. Let's go to Scripture. Here we are. Bands of Syrians had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a little girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. Now, I just want to stop right there and say for a moment, when Scripture says little girl, uh, the word teenage hadn't been invented yet, she's really uh, about teenage Age. It's a teenage girl, okay? She had been given to Naaman's wife as her, her house servant. So she was certainly old enough to run the affairs of a household. So she was, think of her as house cleaner. Think of her as uh, doing the family checkbooks. I mean, she was that mature, but she wasn't an adult yet. So we can, we can say that she was a teenager, okay? So, so uh, the armies had invaded her land. She had probably seen her parents killed and she was captured by Naaman's army and taken back, and she's now placed in Naaman's household and given as, to Naaman's wife as a maid. Let's continue with that scripture. One day this girl said to her mistress, or Naaman's wife, I wish my master, that's Naaman, would go to see the prophet in Samaria because he would heal him of his leprosy. Now again, let me remind you, she has been captured by Naaman's army. She's probably seen her parents killed. Let's just, maybe she looks something like this. A cute girl, about teenage age. But we can see from Scripture, she is not rebelling against her fate. She's acting kindly toward her captor, Naaman. And because Naaman was a kind man, he knew that, uh, we, we know that he and his wife have been kind to this girl. They love her. They would have treated her like a daughter. They've made her part of the family. So Naaman is not a cruel general. He's not a cruel army person. He's being kind to this girl. Yes, her parents have been killed, but he has a kind heart. They're doing what armies do, what war is all about. It's, it's, it's terrible, yes. Awful things happen and people die. But yet, he loves this girl and his wife loves her and they've taken her in and they're treating her as a daughter. They're treating her kindly. Uh, and she, she came from a home. We can, we can tell by her response, I wish that my master, I wish Naaman would just go to the prophet in Syria because then he could get healed of his leprosy. We can tell by her response. She has been raised by some smart parents. She's been raised by God-fearing parents. She's been raised with integrity. She came from a home that lived with integrity. They honored God in her home. So she's living out her faith publicly. She had character and she understood integrity. Now again, let me repeat, Scripture calls her a little girl. Actually, we can put her in the teenage bracket. And I can imagine, as she's growing up back home, I can imagine her parents teaching her this principle. Honey, always do what's right. Always do the right thing, no matter what, even if it means suffering, because God will always be with you. Depend on Him. I can imagine them teaching her that. And she's actually living that out now. She's doing the right thing. In the midst of captivity, she's showing compassion to her master. Wouldn't it be wonderful if parents today were teaching their children, do what's right, sweetie. Always live with integrity. Even if it will cost you. Always do what's right. How, how different would our world be if we had teenagers who were always doing what was right. 
And if we had parents who were, were saying, no, you're not going to do that because that's sin. So many parents that I talk to, well, you know, she's 17, she's 18 now. I just let her make her own decisions. And I just want to say, as long as she's living under your roof, <laughs> you're still the mama. You're still the dad. Go ahead and set boundaries and enforce the rules that need to be enforced. Go ahead and teach her or him, yeah, we're going to church. You may not want to, but we're going to church because that's what we do as a family on Sunday mornings. Well, obviously, she was from this kind of family. They had set boundaries. They had established rules. They had established integrity and character. They were God-fearing people. And so now she's living that out. She's living out her integrity. She's doing the right thing. And, and, and she knew about the prophet Elisha who lived in Samaria. And so this girl is a godly teenage girl. She knew the stories about how God had used Elisha. And she knew there was nothing that God couldn't do. So she's acting in faith. In faith, she's encouraging Naaman, her master, to go seek God's touch by going to the prophet Elisha. She wasn't intimidated by Naaman and his prestige. She was courageous. She saw his pain, she called it by name, and she knew of a pain reliever. And that pain reliever was Jehovah God. And so she just told Naaman where he could find help. Sir, this is where you can go. I care about you, sir. I would love to see you healed. Here's a man who can do it. Please go see him. And her lifestyle was so reflective of her own faith that her master actually listened to her. I mean, usually we would think, oh, pff, she's just a girl. Pff, she's just a servant girl. Pff, what does she know? No, her lifestyle was of such integrity. Naaman listened to her, and he decided to take her advice because of the lifestyle that she lived. Well, that says a lot about her. Well, so King Ben-Hadad doesn't want to lose his right-hand guy, Naaman, and so he's quick to agree when Naaman asks if he can go visit Elisha in Samaria. And so King Ben-Hadad sent an official letter and gifts with Naaman. We see this five-star general rolling through the countryside with, get this, 750 pounds of silver. He's rolling through the countryside with 750 pounds of silver, 240 pounds of gold, and at least 10 full sets of clothing. Wow, that's a big bundle. <laughs> this is a treasure, ladies. This is a treasure with an estimated value of nearly $100,000. Wow, that's a lot. Now, it's hard to travel when you're sick, isn't it? How many of you have traveled when you're sick? It's not easy. It's just not fun. I mean, if you're sick, you just want to be at home and in your own bed and with your own comfort stuff, your own Kleenexes, you know, your own Vicks salve or whatever. Well, think of him. He has leprosy. He has this fatal disease. He's in a chariot, and he's going through the countryside, which is, you know, not nice paved roads that we have, but it's full of potholes and rocks. and blah, blah, blah. So that's how he's traveling, and he's sick. It, does, it doesn't feel good. I can relate. I, I can remember one particular time I was really sick, and I was traveling internationally. But this is interesting. A couple of weeks before I went on this international trip, I just happened to read in some kind of magazine or something that most airports have a doctor on call. I didn't know that. And so that just kind of stuck in my mind. I thought, that is good to know. Because if I'm ever traveling and I get sick, I'll just ask for the airport doctor. So I just file it up there in my brain. And a few months later, I was traveling. And I can't remember where I was coming from, but I remember I did have a long, well, not a long, maybe a two or three hour layover in uh, Hong Kong. And so I, I got off the plane and, oh, I was just feeling terrible. You know how you feel when you're, you're so swollen right in here and your throat hurts so bad? You feel like you're swallowing razor blades. And you feel like every time you swallow, somebody's just ripping up your throat with a knife. It was awful. And uh, I, I went to just, I don't know, I think it was a Burger King or something. I just went to the counter and I said, do you have an airport doctor? 
And they said, yes, we do. I said, I, I need you to call him. So they called the airport doctor within five minutes. He was there. Well, by this time, my fever had reached a dangerously high temperature. I think it was something close to maybe 99. Uh, and he came, <laughs> checked me out, and gave me a wonderful drug that really helped. You know, overseas, you can get stuff that's prescri it's a prescription here. You can just get it over the counter overseas. So it was amazing. I thought it's a great drug that really helped me quickly. I think they called it... Uh, Tylenol or um, something like that. Wow, I, I, was, uh, I was very lucky to, to be in that situation. But so you can imagine how tough it is for uh, Naaman to be traveling through the countryside feeling terrible. He needed some Tylenol, didn't he? <laughs> so let's get back to scripture. Ben, uh, king Ben-Hadad of Syria. Let's just call him King Ben for short. He's uh, sending a letter to the king of Israel and Elisha is living in Samaria. That's the central region of Israel. So Elisha is living uh, pretty close there to where the king lives. Now let's go back to scripture. Here we go. The letter to the king of Israel said this. The man bringing this letter, that's Naaman, is my servant Naaman, and I want you to heal him of his leprosy. <laughs> well, when the king of Israel read it, he tore his clothes and said... This man sends me a leper to heal? What, what, what? Am I God that I can kill and give life? He's only trying to get an excuse to invade us again. In other words, he thinks he's being set up. Hey, heal my general or we will rage war on you and kill you and your people. Yeah, what a setup. He's scared to death. What? I can't heal anybody. Why would you even ask me to do that? Well, Elisha, the prophet, gets wind of what's happening. Let's keep reading. But when Elisha, the prophet, heard about the king of Israel's plight, he sent him this message and said, Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there is a true prophet of God here in Israel. In other words, hey... <laughs> Do you think this is too hard for God? Hey, if, if God can create a universe, if He can set the stars in the sky and call each one by name, if He can put this whole world in motion, if He can create a human being out of a dirt clod, well, well this is nothing to Him. This is just nothing to God at all. God has this. Because he can do anything. So, so just go ahead and send Naaman to me, king. Send him to me because I'm on a first name basis with God. Wouldn't it be great if we all had that kind of faith? Really, I'm on a first name basis with him. Hey, I'm a child of the king. Hey, I still have access to the palace. Hey, guess what? I get to sit at his dinner table every single day. I mean, we're this close. We, we have intimacy with each other. He calls me by name. I call him by name, God. <laughs> and so, yeah, wouldn't it be great if we would exercise the kind of faith that is ours? And so Elijah's doing this. Elisha is doing this. So, hey, send Naaman to me. God can do what man cannot do. And, and then Naaman and all of Syria will know that Jehovah God is real. And that he's to be loved and he's to be worshipped. So let's get back to scripture. So Naaman arrived with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's home. Elisha sent a messenger, probably a teenage boy, sent a messenger out to tell him, go wash in the Jordan River seven times and he would be healed of every trace of his leprosy. Let's keep reading. But Naaman was angry and stalked away. That's 2 Kings 5 to 9. Naaman was angry and he stalked away. Hey, I'm a five-star general. I'm in a, as important as a governor or a state senator. He's loved by all. Hey, I command thousands. People respect me. Are you serious? I'm, I'm honored by people. And this guy doesn't even come to the door to greet me. It's like slapping him in the face. He felt humiliated and he stomped away. The NIV version of the Bible says he left in a rage. In other words, hey, I'm ticked off. He's angry. Okay, back to your worksheet. Though Naaman is consumed with the problem on the outside of his body, there's actually an even greater problem on the inside. And it's the issue of pride. Yes, Naaman is a wonderful man. 
Yes, he's kind and loved and he's honored by all, but guess what? He's full of pride. Let's look at the prescription again. Elisha's errand boy delivers the prescription to Naaman. Naaman, go wash in the Jordan River seven times and you'll be healed. This infuriates Naaman. The Jordan is filthy. And the Jordan, actually the name in Hebrew means the descender. It means you have to descend down and down and down. If you, if you get my book, the master, Masterpiece out there, we have a whole chapter on the Jordan and how it was filthy and you descend down to go to the Jordan. It was vile. It was bacteria filled. It was disease ridden. It was horrific water. Now the following scripture tells us Naaman objects and he says, hey, hey, there are other rivers that are much cleaner. I mean, back in Syria, back in my home turf, we have some beautiful rivers and lakes and ponds that are clean. They're so clean we can drink water out of them. So if I'm going to wash, if I have to take a bath and I have to do it seven times, why wouldn't I go back home and do it in a wonderful, sparkling, clean river with water coming off the rocks? I mean, that's where I want to take a bath. I want to, I'm an important man. I bathe in clean water. But by now, ladies, we know, don't we? It's not just about the bubble bath. <laughs> There's something else, something much deeper that's going on inside of Naaman that God wants to heal, and it's his issue of pride. Well, his officers love him, and they try to reason with him. Let's go back to Scripture. But his officers tried to reason with him and said, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? In other words, if they told you to do something hard, You'd have probably done it, right? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply to go wash and be cured. Hey, Naaman, think about it. I mean, if the prophet had told you to do something really, really, really difficult, well, we know you. You'd buckle up and you'd go do it. Like, if he told you to eat a hundred grasshoppers, you'd probably done it. Or if he told you to staple your thumb to a rock, <laughs> or maybe hike up Mount Everest without a coat or, or barefoot, whatever, you'd buckle up. You'd find the courage and the boldness to do it because you're just that kind of guy. Well, then just be happy that he's telling you to do something so easy. I mean, this is simple. Just do it, man. <laughs> well, here's the deal. Naaman wanted to skip the process but still receive the gift of healing. And ladies, on your worksheet, this is the bottom line. We can't skip God's process and get His gift. Skip the process and forfeit the gift. Skip the process and forfeit the gift. Skip the process and forfeit the gift. No matter which word we choose to emphasize, that sentence shouts volumes of truth. Skip the process and forfeit the gift. And oftentimes, ladies, we struggle with the same issue. Oh, I want to grow closer to God. I really do. But I don't really want to make the time to spend with God every single day. I don't want to have to read the Bible every day. I'm too busy. I mean, I've got my own thing. I even have my own ministry. So I don't really have time to read the Bible every day. <laughs> no, I don't have time for that. Yeah, I want intimacy with God, but I ah, don't want to go through the process of what it involves to get that. That just takes too much effort. Well, past generations knew about the process very well. In other words, when they wanted revival in their churches, oh, they would pray and pray. They would come together and they would have these things called prayer meetings. And if somebody's marriage was falling apart, they wouldn't simply pray for them. They'd come together and pray and fast. You see, they knew about going through the process. And they received God's touch or God's intervention or, or God's uh, gift because they were willing to go through the process. They knew that value. Do we? Because often we want what God wants to give us. Yeah, I want to be sitting at the table with you every night. I want access to the palace. Yeah, I want to know that I'm a child of the King. I want to live like it. But you know what? It takes too much effort to get that. I don't want to read the Bible every day and pray and go to church all the time. Okay, I'll go a couple times a month, but man, every, we don't want to go through the process 
to get all that God wants us to have. And that's where we see Naaman. Hey, I want the healing. I want that gift. But I don't want to go bathe seven times in the stinking, vile, bacteria-ridden Jordan River. Ugh. Let's get back to Scripture. 2 Kings 5.14 So Naaman went down to the Jordan River. His officers talked him into it, didn't they? And he dipped himself seven times as the prophet Elisha had told him to. And his flesh became as healthy as a little child. And he was healed. Wow. Ah, oh, thank goodness, Naaman. You finally listened to some common sense. Thank goodness. You finally humbled yourself. And you washed in that dirty river. Naaman's pride almost cost him his life. But ladies, in the healing of his leprosy, Naaman was also beginning to be healed in his heart. Naaman's pride was washed away in the Jordan River right along with his leprosy. Okay, so what does this mean for us? Well, maybe we need to ask ourselves this question. What's my leprosy? What problem am I trying to conceal? What hurt am I trying to cover up? In what area of my life do I need to be healed? It's not actually about taking a bubble bath. <laughs> it is about becoming totally obedient in God's sight. It's not really about the bubble bath. It's about becoming totally obedient in God's sight. You see, ladies, God wants to do incredible things in you and through your life. And most of the time, He needs to take us through a process to get us to that point. So are you willing to go through the process and receive all that He wants for you? Well, Susie, what, what is the process? I don't know. It's different for each of us. But oftentimes, it involves cleansing. He wants to cleanse you with His Holy Spirit to make you more like Him. So it comes down to trust, doesn't it? And surrender. And total obedience. Long time ago, when I was about um, probably 13, I made this commitment. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Anytime, anything, anywhere. I've never regretted it. Yes, Lord. Anytime, anything, anywhere. And I've never regretted it. Never regretted it. And if you're willing to say this, He'll do the rest. He'll do the rest. Whatever your leprosy is, he wants to cleanse you. He wants to make you clean today before you leave this wonderful ladies' retreat. Whatever your leprosy is, ladies, it may be pride, it may not be pride. Whatever it is, He wants to cleanse you and He wants to make you clean. And guess what? <laughs> there's nothing he, he can't cleanse. Maybe there's one or... Maybe there's one person here, or there are a few people here who are thinking, you know what, even if I got carried to the table... Susie, I've done some things that I'm pretty sure a lot of other ladies in here haven't done. I, I don't think I could ever make it to... I just don't deserve to be at that table. I don't, I don't deserve to be that intimate with the King of Kings. I don't deserve... I could never enjoy that kind of intimacy with God because I've done some things. I mean, if, if we were doing spiritual surgery, so to speak, and you could just slice open my soul, you would see a, a, lot, of, a lot of stains... I've done some things that I'm, I, oh, I'm so regretful of the things that I've done, Susie. You see, I could, I, ladies, I want to tell you, <laughs> there's nothing too dirty that God can't clean. Sorry, you willing to be clean? <laughs> well, what does that involve? Well, it may be a process. And that's between you and God but He wants to bring total cleansing and restoration and wholeness to you. So ladies, will you think about that 
as we play this music video, and then I'm going to come right back and pray for you. Ladies, are you clean? If you're not, you can be. If you're not, you can be. There is nothing that God can't cleanse. Will you bow your heads and let me pray with you? Just let me lead you in a guided prayer. Right now would be a great time if you're not feeling clean 
to tell God that. So just silently tell him. Either say, thank you, Lord, that I am clean. Or just go ahead and be honest and say, Lord, I, I, I don't feel so clean right now, Jesus. Just tell him exactly how you feel. Be honest. And if you, if you don't feel clean right now, it would be a great time to say, Dear Jesus, I want to be clean. I want that. I, I don't know about this process thing, Jesus. Tell him that. I don't know about this process thing. That kind of scares me because it's the unknown. But I can trust you. Because I know you're a God who loves me. You died for me. You conquered death for me. You're alive right now. And so just tell him, ladies, dear Jesus, whatever process you need to take me through to help me become all you want me to be, do it. Yes, Lord, I am willing. Yes, Lord, I am willing. And dear Jesus, I ask that you cleanse me right now. Jesus, I want to be at your table. <laughs> I want to be totally cleansed. I want to know that I know that I know I am not the weakest link. I want to be restored and whole. Thank you that I'm a child of your kingdom that I still have access to your palace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that there is nothing in my life that you can't cleanse. So, Father, I surrender all. Cleanse me now. I want to be all you want me to be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see, all I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me.